Assassins Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algman. Data is everywhere in our businesses, and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. Our show is produced by Algman Business Media, where we make having your own video podcast as easy as joining a video call and sending an email. At Algman Business Media, the stage is yours. Today on Data Leadership Lessons, we welcome Chin Hong. Chin is VP of Product Management at Couchbase, the modern database for enterprise applications. A senior engineering executive with more than 25 years of experience, Chin previously held roles at Hewlett Packard, Oracle, Siebel Systems, as well as others. Chin, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, uh, Anthony. So like we do with all our first time guests, please take a moment and just tell the audience a bit more about your career before Couchbase and kind of how that led you to what you're doing now. Sure. So I got my undergrad degree from UC Berkeley and I stayed on uh, for my graduate uh, degree, a master's degree uh, at Berkeley, working on postgres under Professor Stonebreaker. Mm. And uh, before that, I took a couple of classes on database technology, but working on Postgres was the first time I was exposed to the internals of a database system. And it was to be programmed in Lisp for the upper half of the system. And uh, Lisp is actually the second oldest high-level programming language, uh, just a year younger than uh, Fortran. And I was responsible for the query execution engine. And so basically using high-level language to recursively process individual nodes within the query plan. Uh, structure as a tree hierarchy. Mm -hmm. I started my first job at Oracle and uh, as part of the small team working, rewriting the lower half of the Oracle kernel to support uh, what we call transaction processing. So basically we implement the role level locking and reconsistency to support higher concurrency mm -hmm. for uh, over TP applications. And uh, if you use Oracle, many of you probably run into the snapshot to all errors. <laughs> That's, uh, that's uh, something that I worked on uh, as my first job. And then continue to work on the multi-threaded server in Oracle 7 or the object extensions for with user-defined types in Oracle 8. And then extensibility framework in Oracle 8i positioning Oracle as a database for the internet. So basically we support third-party extensions for text, spatial images, and other data types. And then I started to move on to work on enterprise applications. So I co-founded a Sera uh, in late 1990s to provide B2B e-commerce as a service, as a managed service. So at that time, everyone looked toward uh, Dell and Cisco and they want to be uh, just a poster child of uh, doing e-commerce successfully. And our, our slogan is, you can be a Dell or Cisco in, in 90 days, up mm -hmm. and running and we manage it for you. And uh, as we all know, timing is a big factor in the success of a, of a startup. So we we're probably too early in the SaaS at that time, and we're tackling probably too complex an application. It's a B two B solution, and has many custom backend complex ERP integrations, and then the internet bubble collapsed on us uh, two years uh, into our uh, uh, into our journey. So I moved on to Siebel and later HP, and before joining Couchbase seven years ago, uh, running the product management. So I had come a full circle in my career back to database. That's so cool. So, I mean, you have, and so you, this this is an episode, I can already tell, yeah. like, this is an episode where I get to like dive back into my roots as a technologist, as a, yes. as a database person, data architect, and think through some of the things that I, I don't spend as much time on these days, and I know a lot of our audience does. And so it's, as I think about it, you, you have these different stages that you've gone through in your career, but data has obviously, obviously been a um, consistent thread. That's and correct. you're working on some pretty deep technical stuff and, and building out features and things like Oracle and, and now doing things uh, with, with Couchbase. It's how do you, like, let's start high level. How do you build new capabilities in databases and get anyone to pay attention to them? Because I can speak from my experience as a, as a data architect. Oftentimes you're so deep in the weeds you, you can barely figure out how to work with what you're currently taxed with and what your current architecture set is, but it can be very difficult to think broadly about new capabilities and, and what you're trying to do. How do you get people thinking outside of what's right in front of them? I agree with you. It's, uh, it's always a challenge for a technologist. And we have, especially in the database system, uh, where it's so deep and broad, and at Oracle, where people spend their whole career just on transactions, right? So that's all they know, and that's all they all they do for the entire career. 
And at Couchbase, we're very close to our customers. And we start, we start with customer requirements. I think it's always good outside looking in, uh, understanding of requirements. If you look at, uh, with the benefit of, uh, of looking at the NoSQL evolution, if you look at uh, in the early days, in the in the nineties, and if you look at all the different systems being developed, address the shortcomings of relational system to handle the at that time the new internet applications, where you have data at a higher much higher volume than your backend or uh, uh, ERP systems, and data comes in different shape and form. It's no longer they don't they no longer fit nicely in in the relational table, and you're dealing with hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of online users all at the same time, globally. And, and uh, that's not a system uh, relational, that's not what the relational system are designed for, or was mm -hmm. designed for. So that forced a lot of companies, innovative, innovative companies like Facebook, you look at early systems from Facebook, Netflix, Google, and uh, LinkedIn, they all built an internal system trying to do, trying to handle these new requirements for modern applications. And that's a genesis of what we call no SQL and non-relational system. So, and uh, I was exposed to it seven years ago when I went out to lunch with a good friend of mine from Oracle. He was working at Couchbase. I just left HP at that time looking for opportunities. And he told me, why don't you look at my company? We're doing something pretty interesting. And uh, we're, we're addressing the needs of modern applications. And as, as I, as I learned more about the company, I got really intrigued by the, not only the list of large customer that they have at, uh, at the early stage of a young company, but the type of application they're running on Couchbase, they're all mission critical. They're running a business on, on, the, on the young and unproven technology and that's how desperate they are uh, because they're running out, they're hitting the walls with the relational system. And uh, so in the early days with Couchbase, I was exposed to the, the requirement side, even though my background is coming from, from a technology and, and that really helps. Mm -hmm. That that makes sense. So let, let let's talk a little bit because yeah. I think about you know NoSQL is still something that is people's. I think it's most data architects have awareness at this point of NoSQL. They, yes. they know they may not all have experience with it just because, like we mentioned earlier, there's you, you kind of do what you have to do, and sometimes you don't get that opportunity to expand into yeah. the NoSQL space. So it is often the second thing people think about. But I'm curious, how often do you encounter workloads and clients that are still using kind of traditional relational databases for things that NoSQL could make much better? Like, is there a lot of this legacy relational stuff still out there that people haven't yet transitioned to a more suitable technology? Yeah, so let me give it an example of... Uh of a customer that we used in Couchbase for, for four years now, and now the hundreds of use cases uh, run on Couchbase internally, they, instead they're still using multiple databases. And uh, at a high level, at a high level, they, they, they have a set of use cases they say the relation is good for and, and the standard is Postgres. And then for NoSQL, Couchbase is, is the standard. So I asked the architect who, who chose Couchbase four years ago and why, so give me, go, go, looking back four years ago, why did you pick Couchbase? And uh, mm -hmm. give me the top reason. Uh, his answer is scale out. The ability to scale out to provide high availability, right? So they were running on on mainframe, and mainframe is monolithic. So if you have one, is is high availability. If, if there's a problem with the mainframe, the whole system is down, right? So and also, if you are going through a digital transformation, you're opening up a system to the end users. So suddenly, from instead of supporting thousands of internal users, you're, you're supporting hundreds of thousands of the, your end users directly. So the ability of system to scale over time uh, is a key requirement. That's very hard to do with, uh, 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 with the mainframe where you have to keep buying bigger and bigger machines. So those, that's for that company or for the architect, that's the primary reason for moving to Couchbase uh, on NoSQL technology. And you may have company that look uh, to NoSQL because of the schema flexibility. Again, uh, let me give you another example. This is the largest retailer, one of the largest retailer in the world. And they have more than a million skills in the catalog. And as you can imagine, if you print out the, the, the schema diagram of the application that can fill multiple walls, it's that complex. There are thousands of tables with all the different relationships uh, tying them together. And there are challenges because of agility. 
to introduce a new product takes weeks and months because they have to go through schema review, understanding how to extend the schema or whether the product fit into the things, existing schema, if they have to change what the implication on, on the existing application. And that process is just way too long and mm -hmm. the police is handled by a DBA committee that doesn't understand what the applications are doing. So, so because of that, they decided to move away from relational database and now all, the entire catalog service running on top of Couchbase with the dynamic schema and a JSON document uh, data model to just improve the ability for them to evolve uh, the application and introduce new products. So, so the different reasons for coming to NoSQL, but at the high level, they are very similar uh, across dif uh, different industry. Mm -hmm. So, are there any? I guess I I don't I don't want to ask an unfair question, but I, yeah. that's kind of my thing. Um, is uh, do you have any workloads or any solutions where you're like, you know what, Couchbase isn't right. You should be using a relational database uh, in, in a different context. Or have you solved for using your technology anything that you would normally use a, a relational database? Uh, definitely. So. So as you say, to replace an existing system, you have to be 10x better, right? Else there's, the change is difficult, not just because of technology, but the skill set, the people that you have and the ecosystem and tooling that you build and process that you build around the technology that you're using today. So if I'm a database architect for a company, I'm, on, I'm, I'm deciding the, the database platform for my application, my default choice today would be a relational system, mm -hmm. right? Because for obvious reason that we may have an existing relationship with the database vendor. We have licenses in place or people know how to use the system. We're all trained to do it. And yeah. uh, it's a lot easier to get, get going. Except when you run into key bottlenecks, like I mentioned, you need to, you, you, are, you need to scale out, right? So if, so uh, I was amazed that when I talked to Couchbase, one of the largest technology company I'm talking literally the largest technology company are running the most mission critical application on Couchbase, the user profile mm -hmm. store. And they're growing, they're adding millions of users every month, right? And, uh, and they, at any one time, they can have millions of users logging into the ecosystem and you need to authenticate and you need to authorize them, you need to do that in sub millisecond. Mm -hmm. That's just not what relational system are designed for. Right. So, so because of that, they, they, as a company, they make, they, they make, make the bet to, to rely on this, at then time a small company, we're talking about Couch Bay 1.8, it's eight years ago, right? So, so that's, to me, that's a long time ago. And they basically bet the company on, on top of it. But they do it in stages. They, mm -hmm. they start with the Couch Bay as a cache in front of their relational system. And over time, they, then they, they, we become the system of record, the main system driving all the user profile authentication. So, so uh, there's certain things that you, you just cannot do with relational, like I mentioned, uh, the ability to scale out to support millions of users uh, at, at that scale, high availability. So if you have to be 24 by seven and you're running a cloud environment, you need to support global deployment, right? You may be in multiple data centers and they all need to be connected to support your global audience. So if mm -hmm. there's such applications, it's very hard for relational to do it. And uh, if you need schema flexibility, you're dealing with, with semi a lot of semi-structured data. Uh, as, uh, you're building new application where JSON is your data, not not just a column. It's basically your your data is JSON. You need to evolve very quickly. And again, so those are good reasons to to uh, to explore a NoSQL system. Right. So it, it for those folks that are a little bit less technical in, yeah. in the audience, can you yeah. just give us a, a quick characterization of what what is NoSQL versus what is this relational database that that we keep talking about? Um, what are the differences between these and and are there some general rules of thumb on why you would choose one over another? Yes. Uh, in the early, I think the, they're going to the evolution. So in the early days, there's definitely a lot more differences. No SQL uh, is focusing on the ability to scale out, supporting web application. They're focusing a lot more on schema flexibility and when not as strong in data integrity. If you are doing a finance, transaction, you probably do not want to use a post a uh, uh, NoSQL uh, five years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if uh, it's consistency, if uh, transaction consistency is the number one driver, you probably should stick with the relational system. But that's changing, right? So so relational system is evolving. They're adding skill capability. If you look at the Aurora, or if you look at the, some of the newer system, 
great system. They're adding scale up capability, even in, even though they're in baby steps. And system, no SQL system like Couchbase, they're adding transactional capabilities. Our latest release, Oracle Seven, uh, Couchbase Seven, we just added multi-statement uh, SQL transaction. So you can do a begin transaction. You can issue a SQL against your JSON data, and then can commit, and will guarantee the atomicity, the asset property of that of that transaction. So definitely they're converging, and over time, uh, I do expect that uh, NoSQL system will take on more and more of the use cases mm -hmm. as we as the technology mature, uh, we get more people trained on uh, on on the new system. So, and let me play for you what I would typically yeah. tell someone when asked that question. So typically yes. when I think about it, relational systems tend to be very good at aggregating data, doing complex calculations, large summations, and, and mathematical equation-driven types of, of um, collections of, of information, yeah. whereas NoSQL tends to be very good at search and retrieval types of information, gaining attributes about a specific thing. This is why we use it for um, like login credentials and, and pulling yes. back um, account information and things like that. Because yes. once you get that one record, then you can get the richness associated with it versus in a relational system, it's very good at taking one attribute and looking at it across a bunch of different things um, or, or really just like using a bunch of different attributes or the same attribute a bunch of, uh, across a bunch of different accounts to do a calculation or understand sales transactions or, or what have you. But uh, for NoSQL, and this is where it gets interesting, there's a lot of middle ground stuff that need to kind of do both. Yes. And in my opinion, I find that the NoSQL um, kind of design approach is a little bit easier to adapt to some of those middle ground use cases versus the relational side. But relational in my opinion, seems to always win in the end when it comes to like large scale calculations, just massive number crunching. I don't know that NoSQL is ever going to be as good at that. Can Would you agree or would you say, Anthony, you don't know what you're talking about. There's there's some really cool tech that we've been working on that that solves for that. Yes. I think at the high level, your, description, your descriptions are correct for uh, for most of the NoSQL systems out there. Because if you look at, uh, like you uh, mentioned, most of the NoSQL systems, the early, especially in the early days, the focus is on performance, scalability, and ability to to retrieve an object, a document at sub millisecond response time. Because you're dealing with millions of of users, right? You're releasing a a, a new game. Suddenly, you have millions of users logging in all at the same time. You need to be able to meet that that requirement. Yeah. And having said that, at Couchbase, our focus has always been uh, uh, marrying the enterprise grade of relational capabilities with the scalability of flexibility of NoSQL platform. So we are the one company that take that unique approach. And if you look at, uh, let me give you an, an example. So we are one, we're probably the only company to have a most comprehensive SQL support on top of JSON. So we extend SQL to support JSON rather than inventing our own proprietary uh, language. For a couple of reasons, uh, as you mentioned, SQL is, is a proven query language for doing Sim, you can do simple select select star from employee where ID equal to X, or you can mm -hmm. do very complex aggregation, multi-way joins, or union intersection, and uh, so it's a very powerful language uh, for building application enterprise applications, and uh, we chose to extend it to support JSON so it can combine the benefit of both. Mm -hmm. So, so we see us position very strongly as, as you mentioned in the middle ground, right? Uh, when people are replatforming their their current relational system. And they need to move to they're looking for a modern database, and Couchbase would be a natural platform for 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 them to evaluate because because then we have a familiar API and query language that they they don't have to retrain their engineering staff. Hmm. That's I so now 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 that I'm interested. Like, well, I was interested before, yeah. but it's like it's 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 thinking about how you're able to start to blend those, and and this is something that I've seen manifest itself in you know a database engine space i've seen it in the in the metadata and data catalog yes. space it's it's like you have these kind of general um 
you know, functionality that gets associated with a particular kind of technology. And That's then correct. all of these vendors start to spring up that start to blur the lines between everything. And so you have to understand like, okay, what's our textbook definition? Yeah. And then why is you yes. know, vendor ABC's offering kind of like a dash of this and a bucket of this and then a, a splash mm -hmm. of this thing over here. And, it, and it's really interesting. But if you don't understand, and for the people out there uh, that are, are listening to this kind of like, I don't understand half of these words, it's there's you have to understand some of the fundamentals before you can really understand what a vendor's approach to what they're doing really is, because they'll tend to exist in a place that blends these things in a unique way that may very well suit your particular needs ex exceptionally well, because they, they're generally doing this because they've identified a need in the marketplace That's that correct. says if we had these technology capabilities all in one and could solve for some of the deficiencies of historical products in this area, hey, we got a yes. good business here. Right? Let me give you another example. So, so uh, very well say, so if you look at, uh, you look at smartphone, right? Mm -hmm. So, Smartphone is a combination of we used to carry a phone, we have emails, we have a pager, we have email system, we have a we have a music player, we have a, a GPS navigator. Now they all combine into a single platform, the iPhone, and uh, it's just not the summation of the part. It's the integration that allows you to build very interesting application, and and give and take the user experience to the next level. So for Couchbase, we're doing the same thing. We're integrating multiple services in, into a single platform. You, you mentioned about very highly scalable key value access. That's where our foundation is. We have a document database of flexible schema. We we support quality indexing so that we retain, retain the quality and doing complex uh, operation as, as, as you just described. And we with analytics. So 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 we describe ourselves as a hybrid transactional operational operational and analytical system. So uh, if you look at a lot of modern application, in real time you need to analyze a lot of data and use that data to drive personalized uh, experience. And uh, we actually have a analytics service that can run independently of the operational system in one single cluster so that uh, you, know, you have one single system and you can do complex, we actually have a MPP engine that can run very complex query at, in real time and do a lot of summation aggregation and find you uh, the data and use insight to drive the interaction all within a single system. Huh. Very cool. So, the, and, and that's, it, it helps to think about things like the phone, right? The phone is something that we probably have, most of us have one within arm's reach right now. Wherever we are, listen, we might be listening to this show yes. on a phone. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite likely. And it's that integration and that blurring of lines and that, that reduction to what's, what is necessary is it simplifies the user yes. experience and it does so with enormous complexity behind the scenes. And that's, that's correct. The thing, is that's it, correct. I often think about how, um, you know, being simple and being concise is a extremely complicated endeavor and it and it takes a lot of effort to like write a short email i agree you with know you. it's yeah. that that classic apology yes. you know i would have i would have written less but i didn't i didn't have the time to do so you know and, this is especially so. true for a distributed system a distributed mm -hmm. system is very complex so as you say our goal is to make the complex system very simple both for a developer architect and also for the for the uh, DevOps uh, person. That's why at, uh, if you look at Couchbase, uh, whether you're running on a desktop or we are running on a 100 node cluster, they're all the same. We auto partition mm -hmm. the data. We we auto automatically replicate the data for high availability. If the nodes go down, we auto recover and fail over and rebalance the data for you, all without interruption to your application. So making complex things simple mm. is very hard and but uh but it's, it's very beneficial to uh, to your end users yeah it, it, and it, it's true it's true in the product and technology space it's true in yeah. the consulting space one of my That's correct, when yeah. i'm coaching consultants i tell them your job is to make your client's life simpler to make it easier yeah. don't bring the problem to your client bring the answer bring the solution to your client and that's where you're going to add value yes. and so you know technology does the same thing is it's, it's nobody really cares 
about the technology. They care about what the technology does for them. And then if you yep. can if you can connect them to something valuable, then your technology is valuable too. Yes. And phone so, is another uh, good way to understand the new types of application that enterprises are building. Uh, we we use I use our phone to do all things today, right? So mm -hmm. to make a reservation, I just actually came back from doctor's office instead of filling out a form, I actually register online because it's easy, mm -hmm. uh, easy, easy uh, registration so that I can walk in and see the doctor right away. And if you think about RMDS, it's, it's one of the largest customer. They're running twenty million ops per second on top of Couchbase at that scale, and mm -hmm. Think about, I think we're old enough to, to remember the way when we used to make our travel plan, we call up a travel agent, right? Say, I'm yeah. going I'm going back in this case, I'm from Malaysia. I'm going back to Malaysia. Can you help me look at what the flight availability between uh, uh, during Christmas? So come back with, with a few choices. We iterate over the phone a few times and you book your ticket. But nowadays we all go to Kayak or Expedia and we do our slicing and dicing, look at all type of options. And and we're all using our phone or, or web browser. and the requirements application trends uh, change drastically. Uh, in the old time, the travel agent log into a mainframe or a large uh, database, and probably hundred, uh, tens of thousands of them doing that at any one time. With mm -hmm. the portal like Kayak or Expedia, now you expose it to millions of users, and they're all doing all kinds of research or, or, or searches uh, or, or using a phone or, or the computer. What we call the look to book ratio. So that's the, the term that uh, they use to describe the number of interaction that you do with the system before you you perform a transaction changes from a few hundred to one to in Amadeus case three hundred thousand to one. It's basically a thousand fold increase. So we're all doing all kinds of requests be, uh, before we we book a ticket, right? And you need a system to be able to handle that increase in interaction with the end user to provide that personalized uh, experience and before they they do a transaction so be able to do that efficiently at a scale that you need globally require a modern database platform that you just cannot do on a legacy uh, system right right so I want to spend before we start to run out of time because I could talk to you about yeah. database <laughs> technologies and Couchbase this entire yes. time. Um, but there's a, a you guys did a um, kind of survey and a research study around di digital did. transformation and, and digital digital architects and and we want to talk about some of the the results from that because I think they're very interesting, especially in sure. the context of the pandemic and, and all that. So you can talk a little bit about what that effort was about and what those those findings were, and we'll. Talking yeah. about some of the details beyond that. Sure. Uh, thank you. We basically surveyed about 450 architects in the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, and France, all the countries that we focus on. And uh, so we asked them a bunch of questions about the, the challenges that they have and, and what they're doing with technology in the, in the digital projects. And a couple of findings are pretty interesting. First of all, as you know, uh, digital transformation has been the top of CIO agenda for, for many years now. And with the pandemic actually put a lot of pressure uh, on, on the enterprises, on the businesses to both change and update the existing system uh, to, ha to handle a new environment and also to deal with the, all the new remote working environment, how the team collaborate. And we, half of the architect uh, actually responded saying that they're under extreme pressure or high pressure to de deliver on the digital projects today or last year versus a year ago, which is about 19%. So there's a three-fold increase in, in number of people feeling the pressure because of the whole pandemic uh, a, a situation. And adopting technology is a key part of making sure that your the transformation uh, is successful. And so we ask question on what technology you're using that helps and doesn't help. and not surprisingly, cloud and big data are the two technologies that uh, more than half of the architects say it would be, they believe would be transformative in, in how they're doing uh, uh, the new projects. And uh, the interesting thing is many of them are still using relational database, as, 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 as you just mentioned. But most of, about 61% of them say that relational systems are holding them back for the reason that, that I just described when you're opening up your system to to the online user, the, the type of requirements are very different than than what the, what you're used to uh, uh, dealing with. So they're all struggling with with looking at evaluating new modern database, and NoSQL is an obvious choice. And we believe that by providing 
right? And skill set is always a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Moving from a system that you know well to a new system, understand the architecture, understand the API, the query language. So we try to make that seamless uh, for uh, for enterprises, and by providing the SQL interface to JSON, that that really helps them, and also help them move in stages, right? You don't have to rip up the whole system and replace with a new one. You can do that over time. Like I mentioned, the largest customer that we have eight years ago when they adopted Couchbase is to use it as a persistent cache in front of the mainframe. Mm -hmm. And then over time, they we become the source of truth. They integrate data from multiple, multiple systems. And eventually, they they actually send a picture that they roll off the truck, the mainframe off the truck, right? So, but they took them, it's a multi-year journey. And, uh, and we believe that we need to help our customer go through that transition in moving from a uh, legacy to a new technology. Yeah, so I, I can relay as a, as a digital architect myself, um, yes. you know, some of the challenges that, that I saw in, in with the COVID-19 pandemic and, and yes. a, kind of a quick and unplanned shift to a widely dispersed workforce and fully remote and, and all of that. Um, and there were some interesting dynamics that I that I, I wonder, um, you know, how it impacts what we did and are doing now. And also, I, I find myself thank you know, being so happy that at least we had the technology to continue working the way we had. Because I imagine, like, if we didn't have the video chat functionality yes. and the cloud backbone for so much of what we're doing with data and technology today, things would have been much more difficult to manage remotely. Um, yeah. Can you talk about some of the findings in that that survey around that, like with the cloud and with some of the remotes, you know, the shift to remote work? What changed in terms of the architecture on the on the back end? Did we have to do anything really quick to to put out fires, or were we ready for this and we maybe didn't even realize we were ready for this? Yes, uh, if we just look at uh, as the consumers our daily lives and how we interact with uh, with enterprise system. Like I mentioned, I just I just uh, have a doctor appointment. I log in. I register online. Going to a restaurant, now you scan a QR code. You're no longer looking at physical menu. And so industry after industry, the, the experience is, is moving to, to digital. And, and the pandemic just accelerate and put more pressure on company uh, to do that. And so you need a system that can provide personal experience for on mobile and, 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 and web. And you need a system that can deal with uh, Deal with a lot of personalized data, right? Different different form and shapes, and uh, and doing with the increase in interaction, right? People looking at menu now, they look at they want to look at photos, they want to look at reviews. That what my wife does all the time, go to the restaurant and just look at all the picture and figure out which which dish uh, to order. And no longer looking at the, at the paper menu, right. and they put a lot of tremendous load on your system that you 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 do not have uh, with the prior application. So you need to think through that that new requirement. You need to think through how how do I architect my, my system to handle that new requirements? And how do I do that in phases, right? It's very hard to rip and replace the complex system o o overnight. And having a system that allows you to phase your changes in is, is, is critical to, to the success of, of uh, the, uh, digital projects. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point for non-technical folks as well is to because we, we think about change management and that, that people and, and customers especially they can only handle so much pace of change. There's only yes. so many different things you can ask people to do all at once. Yeah. So you have to think about how can we ease people into a new way of interacting with our organization. And that's true on the customer side. And I think that we can think about things like menus and, and how people yeah. order food and, and, and do things that we do all the time. But then also on the employee side, as we serve our employee base and, and help them help us, right? How do we serve our employees so that we can put them in a position to be successful, whether they are remote working, when they're, th when they're in the office, when they're traveling for whatever purposes that they have, how can we give them an experience in their work so that they can do their best work and so that they can help our organization grow in the way our organization needs to, to serve those customers who we are now engaging with in, in ways that for many organizations, they hadn't done before the last year or two. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So I guess we're, 
we're lucky to live in an era that we have a lot of tooling help to help us to work remotely. The video conferencing is one. So, so we're now using a lot more frequently than, than, uh, uh, than we used to a year and a half, and, and a half ago. The ability to do messaging instantly with, with groups and one another uh, that helps the communication. Then you definitely need to find a way to bring people together, whether it's informal happy hours, virtual happy hours that we do uh, once in a while, just, just to make sure that we continue to have the informal interaction. We're missing a lot of the, of the hallways conversation and knowledge transfer uh, in the remote environment. So we need to find new ways to keep in touch. And uh, it's challenging uh, for, for, uh, for a lot of companies. And many of us are used to working remotely. So it's, it's a, it's an easier transition uh, for some of, some of us uh, than others, but Surprisingly, in a survey, architects and most companies are responding quite well to the challenge. And more than, mm -hmm. despite the increased pressure to keep the lights on for assisting application and accelerate new projects, and about 48% of the uh, architects just say they are delivering on, on their digital projects and interrupted by the pandemic. That, that is a good sign. Mm -hmm. But it is. It was still a troubling sign. One of those those uh, figures that was were in that report is that level of pressure and stress was definitely more yes. pronounced now than it had been in the past. Definitely, yes. And I and I think you know when I think about it, it it's. You know, just like we have this convergence of the human and the digital in terms of how the customers are engaging with our businesses, I also see, and I've seen this for a long time, this is probably decades in the making, mm -hmm. is the convergence of the technology application and the technology data. It used to be in our organizations, we had a data group that was doing That's data correct. and back office stuff and building our, our databases. And then we had the application group that was working on user interfaces. And yep. I, I would venture to guess you've written a click event or two in your <laughs> life as well. And it's like, these used to be totally parallel groups. And That's those correct, yeah. have converged greatly. And I think kind of NoSQL sits at the heart of a lot of that. Yes, yeah, well, so I, I, but... I mentioned that uh, high, high availability scale is one key requirement. The data flexibility and being, being able for an application group to be responsible for your own schema and the evolution of it is key because with the new microservice architecture, you have a, a huge application is not broken down into microservices and there are different scrum teams that are responsible for each of the microservice and they're responsible for their own schema. Uh, and in, in many cases, the choice of the database as well. So putting the responsibility back into the application, a lot more agility and uh, uh, enable the ability to really evolve uh, quickly. And, and we all, and in nowadays, if you, uh, companies are rolling out application on a daily basis, changes application. And you just couldn't do that when you, you have more between the groups, right? And then you have to go to committee to get a change approved before you can implement something. Yeah. So from your perspective, then, as a person who works for an organization who's building, you know, this, this technology and, and at that forefront of data and applications and that convergence in the cloud and, and all of these scalability uh, considerations, how do you recommend people go about managing, managing a technical career for like those folks that are looking and saying, wow, I've been doing, you know, data warehousing for the last 20 years, or mm -hmm. maybe a, a college student that's getting ready to graduate and says, you know, I got to figure out where do I want to focus? What kind of advice do you have for about what what's coming up? Like, how do people manage their careers in this time of, you know, confusion and uncertainty and convergence and all of these things that are kind of mashing together to create these experiences? How do you pick a spot or like what do you focus on to become effective in your career in this current time? Yes, uh being curious is good. So as you mentioned, things are changing so rapidly and uh, we constantly need to relearn and uh, new technology. But the good thing is that for myself personally in the data space, conceptually, things hasn't changed that much. Transaction, the concept of transaction is still valid. People still yeah. talk about asset, right? This is implementing that in the new environment, new architecture is, 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 is challenging. And in some case, interesting, right? So, mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, Taking what we used to do in a, with the monolithic system 
and applying that in the in the world where things are distributed. Uh, and eventually, from we're going to push all the way to now we're looking at as a company looking at edge computing. A lot of company happening at the yeah. computing is happening at the edge, and a lot of interaction happening at the edge. And how how do you when you have from a few data center now you're exploding to hundreds and thousands of edges, right? And mm -hmm. how do you manage that complex environment? So, and uh, being curious, continue to to learn for myself is is understand the the space that I'm in and and tracking the the advances in their space. The good thing is that there are so much on that you can you can research on the web. And if you want to get your hands on the system, there's so so many systems that provide free online account that you can sign on like uh you can just sign on and, and start doing some simple prototyping just to learn about the technology. So mm -hmm. so I think time is a challenge. So if you have the curiosity if if if, if you're willing to learn, I think there are lots of uh, channels that, that allow you to uh, to do that. Yeah, I would, and I would add to that. My own advice is, is yeah. you know, understand the fundamentals. Understand yes. when we say SQL, understand how to write a query, and understand That's how correct. some basic relational data does work. You don't have to become a nest, you know, an expert necessarily, but dabble with it. Understand a little bit about it. Understand what documents are and key value pairs, and and how yes. to do some basic JSON texts, and and just understand what that world is about, and then understand how programming works. Even just pick up some Python. Python is is accessible. You can you can understand that. So get some of these kind of basics in the core areas and then start to understand, okay, how do these different technologies twist them? How do they bring yeah. different strengths together in unique ways and then make it so that you can scale greatly or that you can have acid types of transactions in a NoSQL environment or how like yeah. those things start to make sense if you have a basis of the foundational principles. And then to your point, I think is as strong a point as can be made is be curious. Under, yeah. like try to understand how this stuff works and let yourself meander through a path under like figure things out and i think that's a good advice as well because you have to understand that story you have to understand the, that, that connectivity it's not all just about features and speed and 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 attributes there's there's a story behind why these technologies exist and that's why i like to have these conversations on data leadership lessons is that we get to learn a little bit of the thinking behind something like couchbase where like yes. we can go out on the web and learn hey this is what couchbase does and it's good at this and, and the reviews say this and this is what the cost model is all that stuff is fine but to understand some of the thinking behind the product from a vp of product that to me is why we do this show is so that we can understand some of that story behind it and connect it to what we might be doing in our career or what our businesses yeah. might need. I agree with you because at the high level, they all look the same, improving QCO, improving user experience, performance and skill, but you need to double click on on exactly what street spot and what type of use cases they're addressing and how and why the assisting system uh, do not address those well. Yeah. And so for those folks that are thinking about Couchbase or thinking about other technologies, do you have any recommendations for like, how do you evaluate these tools when you're to your point, like they all kind of sound the same, especially when you're not an expert in this area. Like I've got a team, I got to do data stuff. I got to figure out a technology selection. And how do I start to approach that in a way that that makes sense? Like how, how yes. do you recommend people do that? So, uh, there are a lot of open source product. Couchbase has one as, is one as well, and then most all of them, if not um, most of them, are all offer of, of community edition. So you can get a hands on on the software easily, and you can, like I say, if they have a cloud service, you can get a free account uh, easily. Just uh, like you say, get a hands dirty and just start prototyping. Think about an application that you want to build, and. Uh, like with our mobile product, one of the first examples that we show people is a to-do list. How to showcase offline capability when when the network is there, you can still edit your to-do list. And then when the network is back, you can, you can see it's synchronized uh, with the cloud database. So do something, a simple application many times will, will help you understand uh, the technology and, and, and what they're addressing uh, 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 behind that. So, so get, get, getting hands-on, learn about the technology, uh, uh, let, build some simple application on your own. And I think that's a good way to start. 
I think that's great advice. And just like that, we're out of time. Like that went by so quickly. I was actually astounded. I'm like, oh my goodness, we've gone over 40 minutes already. Um, but I think that's a great note to, to end on is, is, is how to go about taking that complexity that is surrounding us and starting to make it simpler and more actionable and, and in a way that um, helps us solve those problems that are, are like, like your research said, are more pressure laden and more important to the success of our organizations than, than they ever have been. Yes. And uh, I know it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It goes by a lot quicker than expected. And I was actually nervous that I, um, I don't have enough topics to, to last uh, 45 minutes, but it went by so quickly. Well, Jin, thank you so much for, for being welcome. on the show. And, and, and I've done my job. If I can get you to forget that you've been on a podcast, <laughs> that we're having a conversation yes. for an audience, then, then I'm doing my job. So I'm, I'm glad that that went by quickly. And I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thank you have you. a good day. You too. And thank you all for joining us today. You'll find more information and links in our show notes. Dive deeper with my book at dataleadershipbook.com and use promo code AlgmanDL at the Data Diversity Training Center for 20% off your first purchase. Please remember to follow Data Leadership Lessons on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you enjoy the show, please rate and review and help others find us. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact.